welcome to the first episode of the Page Turner podcast, brought to you by me, Kari Medill, and my co-host, Rob Roy McCandlist. Tonight, we are thrilled to bring you an author, award-winning author, and more recently, his stories have been turned into a Hulu series as well as a feature film. Welcome our guest, Nathan Good. Uh, Hi, thanks. <laughs> Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on. Thanks, Nathan, and welcome to the show. Rob Roy, you going to say hi? Hey, how's it going, Nathan? <laughs> it's going pretty good. Good. <laughs> good. So for tonight, we um, have Nathan on the show, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with his work, but he's got some great stories. First of all, he has a short story compilation called North American Lake Monsters, which has recently been made into a Hulu series. Nathan, pretty exciting year for you. Uh, yeah, it's been uh, it's been it's been pretty wild. Like, tell uh, us, uh, tell us about that. Like, you must be blown away. It's been happening over such a long period of time. Like the development of these things takes such a while that by now it doesn't feel, uh, you know, uh, overwhelming anymore. Um, but, uh, but it, it certainly did for a while. And, and, uh, uh, so I guess I was, it came directly out of the, uh, the movie itself. Um, Babak and Vari and his uh, producing partner, Luke and Toe, had optioned uh, the, sh- the novella, The Visible Filth, to make into the movie. And while they were called Wounds, and while they were uh, writing the script, or while Babak was writing the script, he read North American Lake Monsters and decided to option that as well uh, to see if they could make it into a television show. So back then when all that was happening, that's when I was really overwhelmed. That's when I couldn't believe, you know, what a strange turn my life had suddenly taken. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and since then it's just been a process of, uh, of development, you know, of finding a, a showrunner, uh, whom they found in Mary laws and then, uh, writing up a pitch and then pitching it to, uh, uh, different studios or different, uh, you know, networks and then getting picked up and then slowly writing it. And, uh, and yeah, that, that all took a couple of years. So are, are, go ahead, Rob. I, I, I was curious, are, are you, are you still actively writing on the show or is it just based off of the short stories from North American? I didn't do any writing on the show. Um, okay. I, I got to sit in the writer's room for a couple of weeks while they broke stories and we talked about the stories in the book when they decided which ones they were, were going to use. And then I, you know, I got to sit in while and, and participate in the, uh, kind of like coming up with, uh, original stories for the show. And, uh, but I didn't do any script writing. Um, uh, if they do get a second season, um, I might take a swing at that, but, uh, the, that kind of thing is, is, uh, you know, there are a lot of ifs between, between my saying that and it actually coming into being. So. Right. We'll right. Right. And then, and have you watched the series? Uh, yeah, I haven't actually watched all of it yet. I'm really kind of parceling it out because, uh, I just kind of want to make it last a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't blame you. I mean, it's, I watched the, uh, one of the episodes. So here in Canada, so for anybody who's listening, um, the Hulu series is called Monsterland and here in Canada, you can find it on the Crave app. It'll be available on October 31st, but right now it's also on the CTV drama app, which is where I watched it. And they're showing, um, one episode called Plainfield, Illinois, which was based on the short story, the good husband. Yeah. And it's a really creepy, authentically chilling take on zombies but it's got that nathan ball and Grude twist which all these stories have which was what made me reach out to you on facebook and and follow you in the first place because i can't remember being so deeply affected by a book um uh, since harry potter to be honest which is a weird <laughs> comparison but I, honestly i i i got so frightened and and the imagery and i dreamt when i read um wounds Wounds is the name of the of the of your other book, which we'll get to soon. But that's the name is is Wounds: Six Stories from the Borders of Hell, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. And so, and I when I first read that one, Rob, have you read that one yet? 
not wounds. I, I finished up North American Lake Monsters, and, and I'm very familiar with The Good Husband, so let's definitely talk about that. Yeah, well, I mean, when I read Wounds, I don't know if you'll like Wounds, because you're, you are so... You're my sweet summer child, Rob, who doesn't read yep. a lot of horror. Nathan, yep. I got to tell you, it was so funny. Rob messages me and he says, Kari, you know, I'm reading this book. I, I, I just don't know what to do. I don't like any of the characters. And I was like, well, Rob, Nathan's not writing to make friends. <laughs> <laughs> no, the writing's great. Let's be clear. Like, Nathan, the writing is so great and the oh. characters feel so real. But, wow. but I, I, I want to root for somebody. And I was having a really tough time finding anybody that I wanted to root for. And, and I really wanted to ask you some questions on that, on that topic. But like, uh, mm. that's, that's where that came, that comment came from. It wasn't, the writing is so horrible. It was the writing no, is no, so no. good. Oh God, yeah. is that how they came across? Sorry, Nathan. No, no. It, 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 it didn't. I, 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 knew, I knew exactly what you meant. I mean, trust me, I get that a lot. I get the, yeah. uh, okay, good, the good. Girl, yeah. Well, I don't know about that because I was, I find myself often rooting for the antagonist. I don't know what that says about me. I could give you some ideas, but this, we're not doing a show about me. Um, <laughs> I found myself rooting quite a few times. I found myself rooting for Tony because she struggled. I mean, she was really struggling. And even though, and I know that she did something that is just unredeemable at the end of and at the end of the story. And I don't want to ruin it for the people that I know are going to run out and get this book after the show. Um, but I found myself rooting for her in that she would make, not make the decision that I thought she was going to make what she did anyway. So, I mean, there is a sense that you can root for somebody for these people who are going through. And w what I love about Nathan's writing is, is it's about people that are just in this deep, dark place um, in their life. Because I find that in Nathan's books and, it, you know, the real monsters are people, which, yeah. you know, they yeah. are. Right. And that seems, Nathan, that seems to be a theme throughout the entire North American Lake Monsters book is that, is that the monsters aren't the real thing that we should be scared of. It's, yeah, it's the people that the monsters end up interacting with. Is that, is that on, on point? It's yeah, it's pretty close. It, it, well, I wasn't necessarily thinking about making saying that the you know mon people are the real monsters so much as I was uh, I was in, I was and remain intrigued by the uh, the notion that we all have the capability of being monstrous within us, yeah. and, uh, and I'm fascinated by people uh, who make decisions which on the outside seem terrible seem poor seem seem monstrous uh but you know i with trying to figure out what happened in their life or what circumstances did they find themselves in in which they found themselves in a place where doing that made sense you know where uh where you know by committing some uh some heinous act to them seemed like it was the only call to make or the right call to make yeah yeah like the but, only way out their only choice yeah. like well, like in the in the episode of uh, Monsterland that I watched, what was based on the Good Husband, when the you know when the girl goes into the room and she, into the bathroom and she sees her partner in the bathtub and she's committed suicide and she she pauses and she goes and scrubs the wine out of the carpet instead of calling nine one one because she had just lived with her for sixteen years and lived with this mental illness and it's just you know it 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 was just it drove her to that moment, whether it was, it was a great choice or a bad choice. That was what she felt that she had to do, which was what I found so interesting because each character faces that in, in each story in a different way. Yeah. And in, in that story in particular, I think, I think it was, you know, a terrible choice and she knows that it was a terrible choice in the story. Yeah. It's in the book. It's a, it's a husband in the television. Yeah. It's, there are yeah. two many women, but, um, it's, uh, you know, it, but it was a, a choice, you know, that came from a moment of abject weakness and exhaustion. And, uh, and, and what follows is this character trying to manage the overwhelming guilt of having done that, of having made that choice. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, 
I guess it's just yeah. That's it, it, that's an example. That's an example of what I was talking about. If someone yeah. you know, of, of you find yourself in a place where something happens, and you just that's the decision you it's make. It's not the right choice. Uh, yes. Let's start from the beginning, Nathan. When did you start writing, and why? Uh, well, I mean, I, I've been writing ever since I was a little kid. I've always, you know, thought that I was going to grow up and be a writer, uh, and, and never. You know, never, never in the sense of that's going to be a career and just in the sense of that's what I was going to do, um, you know, in addition to whatever other career I might have. Uh, if you can hear that chime, I'm sorry. I don't know how to turn the, the <laughs> text off of my computer. That's we'll just a- call it a ghost. We'll just call it a ghost. <laughs> Let's go with that. <laughs> uh, and, but it didn't start... You know, then I, I wrote a little bit when I was in college, in high school, and uh, I went to Clarion Writers Workshop when I was in my early twenties. Okay. I sold a couple of stories directly after that experience, and then decided that uh, I just felt like I wasn't the kind of writer I wanted to be. I felt like I didn't know enough. Uh, I just wasn't equipped to be who I wanted to be, uh, and so I stopped writing for several years, about uh, about eight, I think, eight or nine, and then. Uh, you guys hear that feedback? No. Yeah. Yeah. Is that? I hope that's not me. What was it? I don't know. I don't know. Like... There's some kind of feedback. I didn't hear any it's feedback. Ghost. It's ghost. It could have been. It could have been me breathing into the microphone. I'm just. Mm. I'm just... <laughs> I'll just keep talking. You keep the, talking. Uh, the uh, and uh, and it was my, in my early 30s, uh, like when I decided. To, uh, to start writing seriously. Um, and, uh, yeah. And that's when I, uh, wrote ego where it takes you and, uh, and sold it. And I, and I continued writing very slowly after that, but, but regularly. Okay. And then, so you, you wrote, you go where it takes you, you sold that. And then I'm assuming you wrote like the rest of the short story. So you started off with short stories. Yes. And then you're still, um, and you're still going with the short stories because you've got two compilations. Um, who are your favorite authors? What do you read? What does Nathan read when he's not scaring the crap out of the rest of us? Um, that's a that's a that's a list that's in flux all the time. Mm. Oh yeah, um, yeah. I mean, uh, bang uh, off your favorite, your top five. Top five um, throughout my life uh, would be. Um, Salman Rushdie, okay. Uh, Annie Proulx. Oh yes, um, Canadian. Yeah, she, no. yeah. She wrote she? the Shipping she, News, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I know that she writes about the West and uh, up, I think, uh, Newfoundland. I'm not exactly sure where she was from or where she lives now. Okay. Um, but you might be right. Um, let's see. Uh, I haven't read him in a long time, but Ernest Hemingway would play an enormous part and uh, a role in just shaping, you know, my idea of what stories can do. Okay. Uh, oh boy, this is this is tough because there are so many names keep crowding in. Um, <laughs> John Le Carre is a favorite, uh, and. Uh, oh, jeez. It sounds like I don't have any favorites, but I, the, it's, it's it's too hard to pick, right? And you don't want to leave out. <laughs> That's what I run into all the time. Like Erin Russell is a favorite. She, I think, she writes amazing, amazing short stories. That's a nice eclectic group. That's that's yeah. a broad group. Uh, I, that's interesting. I, I I don't. I'm not sure. I heard any horror writers in there. Is that right? I mean, I guess not but th- that doesn't mean they're not there too you know um right. uh, uh adam neville is a favorite uh of course a group on stephen king straub and barker right uh, uh livia llewellyn is a, an amazing writer i'll read anything that she writes um yeah i mean that's what i mean they're just they're just i could probably if i had time i could probably throw out 40 names yeah yeah no i hear that too i um I once read a quote where you said the scariest sound for me is someone crying in the next room. Yeah. Can you explain that? Uh, Yeah. Not so much, I think, scary, but like the worst, the most unsettling, unpleasant sound. Uh, Because because 
there are different strains of horror, obviously, and uh, and you have the one strain which is which is uh, the tropes. You know, the, the the tropes that are almost kind of Halloween like and fun, like the the ghosts and the vampires and the haunted mm. houses and all that stuff. And then you have the more psychological, reality based horror, which is the stuff that really digs into me. And that's the sound of this kind of unanswerable uh, pain, uh, this uh, this kind of aching sadness uh, that you wish you could make go away in someone, in, you know, in someone that you love, and, and and you can't because you're powerless to do it. And uh, and that that to me is 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 the worst thing. And that's the kind of energy that you know fueled a lot of the stories in North America, like monsters. It's just the desperate isolation of the human condition. Yeah, just the sadness, the overwhelming sadness of so much of life. And, and I'm not somebody who believes that, you know, life is intrinsically sad and that, you know, and that I walk around sad all the time myself. But it's such a it's such a big part of being alive, you know, and it's like um, and when you have uh, when you add to that, you know, things like depression, uh Various strains of uh, mental illness, you know, this kind of this kind of pain that you can't fix, uh, you know, in the way that you'd want to. Uh, I mean, obviously, there's there's things like therapy and medication. I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about no. if someone that you love is feeling that kind of pain and they're feeling it in the moment, and it's not the kind of pain that you can make go away. You know, you can't you can't do it, you know, for somebody, and uh, and that's uh, that's tough. And you had a bunch of characters that that were kind of in that predicament themselves, uh, where where, at least for me, I could feel I could feel that if if it was possible to help them, and this might have just been me, been me like trying to grasp a protagonist that I could relate to or that I could root for, but I, I felt some of them, if they could just get the right kind of help, and I had no idea what it was, that then they'd be on a better path. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, I think I think that's the case with a lot of those characters, and this is and a lot of times it was the protagonists who just can't you know they're feeling this kind of pain and they can't get out of their own way. You know, I think about the, the protagonist of the title story, North American Lake Monsters. He's an ex-con. He's coming out of out of prison after several years inside, just trying to reacclimate to to being a husband and a father, and he just doesn't know how to do it. He doesn't know how to get over his own. Uh, self-loathing and he doesn't know how to get over uh the fact that his his wife and his daughter are different people now and uh and i'm just i'm i'm fascinated by that by that by people who are who are trapped by the way they perceive the world and uh and i guess that's a little bit of a digression from where we started from about dealing with uh sadness and mental illness but it's to me it's like it comes from the same root you know it's uh oh, absolutely yeah it's this in, inability to answer that 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 painful question because maybe and, there is no answer to it yeah and he was very interesting i i let, i thought he was an interesting character too because i think at least twice within the story he 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 reflects on himself as a weak person, but then, but then kind of projected that out to his wife and his daughter as they're so weak and he would have to protect them, which was a really interesting kind of uh, like, like he, it it seemed like he would think of himself as weak and then he'd be like, no, no, it's not me. It's gotta be somebody else. And he kind of projected that out. Yeah. Cause you can't, I mean, if you, you know, if you, if you acknowledge it and truly acknowledge it in yourself, that means you gotta do something about it. And that's, you know, he wasn't he wasn't able to do that, or at least yeah. wasn't. Yeah, at least not by the end of the story. <laughs> maybe the, maybe by the end of the story, he's he's at, at the threshold of being able to. That was a curious. I I I'd hate to spoil that particular story, but that was a curious end to that uh, to that story where it seemed like he still had choices left. Is that is that how you saw him, or did you see him more tied into where he was at? No, I thought I thought he had choices. There, there, are, there are some of the stories in that book. It's called a, it's called a book of horror stories. Uh, but there are some stories in there that I that don't feel like horror stories to me. I mean, people can call them whatever they like, and that's fine. But that's one that did not feel like a horror story to me. That uh, that felt like a guy who who by the end, 
was at least able to acknowledge the possibility that maybe he was somebody who was, you know, worth caring about. You know, maybe maybe he wasn't that terrible. And if he can accept that about himself, then maybe he'll stop lashing out. You know, it's not like he... he head or anything like that but it's I, I wanted to get him to a point where he was able to apprehend the possibility and uh that's one of the stories that to me felt like i had a, a more a more hopeful ending right right no that was nice which one so, which which was your favorite short story out of that book rob roy uh <laughs> <laughs> you know i the the very first one was very affecting to me uh and and i still and i still think about it especially the the very last scene of that uh and uh so kudos to you nathan because i was like oh you know we're gonna read this book and i'm gonna talk to this author and that'll be fun and then read the first story and was like whoa this is this is gonna be different because th this guy can really reach in and grab hold of you yeah. and and make you care about these characters but you know, this is a this is a quote unquote horror collection, and and I was left somewhat horrified by the end of that. But then intrigued, like what what could you do with different things? And what was really nice, I thought, on each one was that they were all very different, even though there were some themes that ran through them. Everybody's situation was different. The so if original. there was supernatural so in there, yeah, the supernatural was always. Uh, unique, uh, and you kind of played with the with some of those tropes from the genre, and uh, I I think, well, I really liked something about every one. I can't remember the name of the one that had the, they were they were called angels, but they were never really explained, and the, and they weren't really angels. They were just some odd glowing, yeah, the monsters you know, of, he of heaven. Oh, that's it. Okay, the monsters of heaven. Right, and that one was was interesting yeah they were all really good i think that one might have been the one that that i was most curious about and you know if it, not spoiling it for everybody listening but that was the one that i wanted to be like nathan what was going on there <laughs> what happened <laughs> i think my favorite oh i have a message for you nathan from from brody my partner he said for me to tell you you're a jerk because after I read Wild Acres, and I'm sorry, I don't think that, but after I read Wild Acre, I wouldn't go outside in the backyard and put the goats or the chickens away for like nine months. <laughs> because I was so frightened. Because it was still out there. And I don't, well, and, and that, I mean, I actually, I'll tell you something, and I've always meant to take a picture and send it to you. I have this little um, railing on my front porch and i've glued tiles with the lines out of all my favorite stories the oh, first wow. line and i've written it out on a tile and glued it in a row and i'll and i'll share the photo but i have the first line if i got the first line from where the wild things are uh call of cthulhu harry potter and uh lord the hobbit and i also have the first line from wild acre because i just love that short story well thank you and and, and tell your husband you were just being prudent Right. <laughs> it's still out there. <laughs> it is. It's still out there. And you know, werewolves for me, every time that what that's what gets me. It's like the carnage. Everybody's on about the, the zombies and the slow burn zombies coming after you. But for me, it's the werewolves. I don't I don't know why. Maybe it's just that that idea that there's an, an a monster inside you that you can't control that will come out in the full moon and start, you know, eating people. I'm totally <laughs> the werewolves. And, are the are the scariest best ghosts? Monsters. Sorry, Nathan. No, I'm not with you. The werewolves for me are the are the scariest and the best monster. Or werewolf? Oh, you're with me. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, yeah. I, mean, I love the fact that you show. And what I think I loved about Wild Acre was the the attack. The werewolf attack wasn't the biggest thing that happened in the story. It was how Jeremy's life fell apart afterwards. Yeah. How he couldn't cope with his guilt because he ran away, which God would, I, I, and I put myself in that position, like, would I have grabbed my gun and run back? Well, that's what you scream at the, at the TV, right? During the horror movie, you're like, get out of there, run. And that's what he does, right? Because there's yeah, no, but, like, but there, his there, were being killed. But, yeah. But if the monster shows up, you run, right? Like... <laughs> Good to know, Rob, that you're going to leave me to get eaten. Remind me never to go anywhere with you where there are werewolves. 
if I find myself in a horror movie and a monster shows up, I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> Well, That's... I would like to say I don't have to run faster than the monster. I just have to run faster than who I'm with. That's right. That's right. And that was the thing with, with that story. You know, I wanted to, you know, th- these were guys, especially this guy. He had a very definite idea of what a man was supposed to do. And he had an mm. idea of who he was. And he yeah. thought he was one thing. And then something happened. The werewolf attack happened. And he realized he was something different. He was not somebody who would stand and, and be the, the, the hero in the movie and charge into the fray, he was somebody who would run for his life. And uh, and that realization just broke him. He didn't know how to he didn't know how to live with himself after that. Or no. yeah, or, or 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 live with anybody else after that. No, no, he lost everything. He lost everything and in the end was out there trying to get it to come back. Now was that so he could kill it or was it so it would kill him too? We don't know. And that's another thing that I love is, you know, the endings are ambiguous. The endings, like, that's one of the things I love about your, your writing, Nathan, is it's gray. It's all, it's all gray. It's a gray area. I appreciate you saying that. That, some, that drives some people crazy. <laughs> oh, no, I love it. That would be me. That would be me. I'm like, let's get on with Nathan and ask him what happened. <laughs> no, I love it. No, you could, no, that's the best story. You don't know. You either make up your own ending or you just leave it at that. No, you're right, and, and 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 it is a lot of fun once you realize that's that's a choice that the author is going to let you make. Uh, that can be a lot of fun because then you can you can either take what the author has given you with that character, especially like like that one, uh, and you know decide what his fate was there. And I kind of have decided what his fate was, but you can also be like, no, no, I think he could, I think he could, you know, become better. Or he could make better choices, or he could he could you know do something here and and kind of succeed and get back on track, uh, and you know and project into that. So that's really cool stuff. That's really cool stuff, and that's a really cool book, um, Nathan. Now, it, what kind of horror movies do you like? Do you are you a big movie watcher? Yeah, I uh, I, I love all kinds of. Well, most kinds of horror movies. Um, I don't, my favorites are the uh, are things that are. My favorite are the are the are, are the you know the kinds of the more serious, uh, but still, not afraid to get crazy over the top sorts of horror movies like The Exorcist or Hereditary things like that. That being said, though, uh, I love a good cheesy horror movie. Uh, one of my favorites are like Return of the Living Dead, The Reanimator, or extremely high on my list of things that I love. Um, I could sit down. I kind of, I kind of like retire my, uh, my, my, my critical gauge when I watch most horror movies, I just kind of set that aside and just enjoy it for what it is. Um, so it would be kind of tough to find one that I didn't like in some way. Okay. So you just, I have to agree with you on that. I think the exorcist is my number one favorite horror movie. Um, and, oh, just the imagery, the sound, um, and just the mounting terror. I, and I read the book by William Peter Blatty. I've read it several times, actually. I read his sequel, Legion, as well. Oh, yeah? Uh, yeah. Have you read that? I haven't, no. Oh, it's good. Did you read The Exorcist? Uh, to be honest with you, I have not. I have it on oh. my shelf, but it's one of those I just haven't gotten around to yet. Uh, yeah, no. oh, it's good. I it's, good. It. it's good. I, I really liked it. Um, now, so writing about horror, like, what are your beliefs? So you say that you love The Exorcist, but do you do you believe in that sort of thing? Like, do you, do you believe in demonic possession? No. No. Okay. So do you do you have belief? Like, do you? What are your religious beliefs? And we're gonna start to talk about sort of wounds here which is six stories from the borders of hell which was your second short story book that came out compilation um Mm -hmm. and they're all based on well hell (laughs) and people's (laughs) near brushes with hell yeah um and i don't believe in hell Um, you don't believe in hell you write about it so vividly though i mean if that's fun that's what i I'm in the same boat with you, Nathan. And and I think that's what makes it more fun to kind of write. Like you can really explore different aspects of that if you're not tied to one particular 
at least that's my thought. You're not tied to one particular belief strain. And but yeah, uh, well, you, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I, that was it. The uh, that's how I feel. I think I think it's I think it's fun uh, to write about. Uh, you know, and in, in the way that I'm doing it, I'm having fun, and I'm kind of like a, a magpie, just taking things from different different places uh, and making something that's uh, kind of my own. And uh, and I think if I believed in it, I would take it so much more seriously. Uh, and I think it would be less fun to write about, but because I don't, because to me it's all, you know, this kind of big imaginative stew. Uh, I just, uh, it's, it's just fun to play with. And these stories, the ones that comprise the second book, uh, are to me a whole lot more playful than the ones in the first book. Um, I felt I had, I got a kind of confidence from the first book in that I kind of allowed myself just to kind of have a good time. Uh, with it, with the story is in the second, and uh, you know my own personal beliefs are. Uh, I, for a long time, I called myself an atheist, but I think now I probably call myself an agnostic. Uh, okay. As I get older, I get, and this is this is something that everyone says as they get older, usually. But uh, you know, you just realize how little you know, uh, yeah. and I am so much less confident about things than I used to be. Uh, I don't for a second believe that there's like some intelligent guiding hand, you know, behind the cosmos. I don't think that's the case, but I also don't think that I can confidently say that there is nothing, you know, that there's nothing, you know, I just don't know. And, uh, I'm, com- I'm comfortable in that mystery. I'm comfortable with a lot of mysteries actually. And, uh, I don't need to know the answers to things. Uh, and, uh, and, and so, you, you know, when I'm writing about hell and, uh, in, in these, the second batch of stories, mm-hmm. It's just, uh, you know, it's just, it's just a canvas. The, what, what it really stands for, for me, in the in the fiction that I'm doing, is a, uh, is. Uh, let me start. Let me let me start over. I'm trying to articulate what I mean. The, okay. uh, I'm fascinated by the idea of hell as being the generative force behind love. I think. Um, and and uh, I think I think that that love is a very uh, can I think love can derange people and make them do strange and dark things. It can take people down down dark paths, and uh, uh, and I'm fascinated by that. And so the big conceit uh, with my version of hell is that that's where love comes from, and so. And so I just have fun playing with that idea and just kind of like twisting it into different shapes for each story and just seeing seeing how that would play out. But is that love? Is that love <laughs> that makes people do dark, twisted things? Or is it the idea of love? Like that woman. Do you remember that story about that woman? I think she was American and she was an astronaut that like worked for NASA. Do you remember that story? Oh, she was across the country yes. wearing a diaper because yep. she wanted to kill her husband and her new... Like, like no, that. she was she was the yeah she was gonna go kill the wife or the new girlfriend. Oh, the wife. She okay, was so the girlfriend. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, that's definitely a different take. I never thought of love as being something that twists people in a bad way. I think that it. I mean, I think well, it's a fictional conceit, but uh, I think that uh, I think when you talk about. Or when I'm using the word, uh, especially in the context of these stories, um, things like obsession uh, yeah. are, are are a subset. You know, to you know, as far as the stories are concerned, that is a that's a branch off of that tree. Um, and uh, you know, people can be deranged by grief. People can be deranged by lust, uh, by loneliness. All of those things, loneliness being the absence of love or the yearning for love. You know, all mm-hmm. of those things. Uh, are expressions of that one core idea and uh and some of them are very sustaining some of them are uplifting some of them are are life filling uh but there are flip sides to those to those notions and that's when things can get dark and confusing and bewildering and uh and dangerous yeah i almost want to be like gosh nathan who hurt you (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> Any of Nathan's ex-girlfriends that are listening right now, <laughs> damn you! <laughs> Look what you've done! My favorite cat scratched me when I was very little, and I never got over it. And that was it. That's his backstory. He's got... <laughs> It'll never be resolved. Oh, betrayal. <laughs> Why? Why? <laughs> That's awesome. So Nathan, any I know um, because I follow you so closely um, on social media. I know that you are writing a new Jack Oleander story, and he yeah. was yeah, and he was the protagonist. I think from my favorite um, story out of Wounds, which was the Atlas from Hell, Atlas mm-hmm. of Hell, mm-hmm. which was just oh my god! I had a nightmare when I first read that about the um, many limbed demon with the eyes that rolled. Mm-hmm. Oh, gosh, that was brutal. And the people with the astronauts with their heads in the boxes and what a brilliant concept. I just I that story blew me away. Um, so what future projects do you have with Jack? You're going to write a feature film or sorry, a feature like a full length novel with him or. Uh, originally, that was that was my eventual goal. Is to, I thought he'd be a good character to write a, some novels about. But then the more I thought about it. The more I thought, you know, am I really going to write whole novels, like several novels about this guy? I just don't, it just doesn't seem practical. It doesn't seem, considering my own rate of, of uh, output and the and the kinds of things that I, uh, that I want to write novels about, I didn't see myself really doing that. But I can see myself writing novellas about him, you know, 20, 30,000 word stories, uh, you know, you know, little quick sharp shot, shot shots at him. Uh, that seems very plausible. And actually, it seems like it would maintain uh, my interest in the character, too, if I was able to get in and get out relatively quickly. So, yeah, the first novella uh, about this character is underway called uh, Symphony of the Lich, in which he is tracking down uh, uh, the sheet music uh, composed by a uh, this demonic entity. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Like a demonic Beethoven. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> um, so you is just, it good music? Is it, it what, what kind of music is it? Is it music that drives you is crazy? It, like is it rock and roll? Like, I mean, is it is it the <laughs> devil's music? Like, <laughs> well, it, this may change because I'm composing it still. But, uh, but oh, wow, there's wow. a short story in the wounds called "The Maw," in which uh, a city is kind of broken down and turned into a like bell of a great trumpet, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Using people as reed instruments. It, it's got a little bit grotesque. I'm thinking that's probably what the symphony is. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so not something, something we're going to hear on the top ten anytime soon. So, something okay. else to keep us up at night, like music that <laughs> will drive you insane, though, too. Like just the sound. <laughs> well, no, because Nathan's big on sound in his music. Like in um, the visible filth, the sound that comes from that cell phone, and the mm-hmm. sound that comes from the skull in the room in Atlas of Hell. Um, it's it's just like these these skull splitting sounds that you would expect to hear in hell. Which... Yeah, the idea is that you know the idea, and this is I think this is important to me too that hell remain potent. That if you just if you hear the lang- its language, if you're exposed to anything from it, it's it's like physically degrading. It'll it'll ruin your body. You know, it'll yeah. ruin your. So not so not like supernatural where they go to hell and back all the time and it's it's almost a vacation for them when they show up. Yeah. Like if not, you go to hell, there are consequences, and if you even hear it, there are consequences. Yeah. yeah. If you hear it, if you just catch a glimpse, yeah, like those guys come back and they still their hair gel still is like intact. <laughs> their hair, yeah, they they look better when they come out of hell than when they went in. <laughs> like a spa <laughs> right like exactly spa. and everybody knows them that's what i like when when <laughs> sam and dean go to hell everybody knows it's the winchesters winchester run around no i really like that idea that they're like you know any part of that should be so debilitating that that it would be bad for for uh, humans to have any interaction with it that's uh that's that's kind of cthulian there right well, that's the the brilliance of it is is yeah. that he thinks of those little details. Yeah. Whereas, like you know, and even even in in Atlas of Hell, when they're in the room, um, you know, in the shack, and just the thoughts that start swarming through their head just because they're near this skull that's emanating, you know. Oh, you never read that. You haven't read that one yet, but nope. <laughs> Sweet Summer Child Rob is is you know. He's, 
It's scary. It's scary. It yeah. is. Like that's that's not my thing. <laughs> I, I freely admit it. Nathan's a great author, and everybody should pick up at least the uh, North American uh, Lake Monsters. Yeah. It, it, oh, it's a really good read. There's some really great stuff in there. Uh, just amazing stuff. But but I definitely don't go out of my way for horror. <laughs> I do. I do. And that's why I love it so much because it's, it's hard to find a great horror writer. There's some good ones. You know, I used to buy those books for a dollar by like William Ness Johnston. He used to write those, the devil's cat books and the devil. I don't know if you ever read those, Nathan, um, but they're just like cheap, sort of cheap dime store horror. And they were good. You know, I was 12 going to mm -hmm. Catholic school, taking the book, the devil's cat with me. That went over great. <laughs> um, but it's fine. It's hard to find great um, horror writers, and so you know, I have you up there, right up there with Stephen King and the rest of them. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. just fantastic. Um, okay. Great work. Um, now you mentioned um, that you didn't want to spend you know a ton of time with Jack Oleander because you know there were other things that you wanted to write. What were those things? Uh, well, just like what when I think things? about things like novel length, like the the yeah. the that interests me that I think will interest me for like those kind of like deeper explorations. Um, Oleander to me is, is about having fun. Um, yeah. the, uh, you know, I just, I, you know, there's a novel I am writing now about a, uh, <clears throat> a man who kidnaps his son, uh, out of school, his little, his little kid takes him on a, uh, a road trip. I don't want to get into too much detail, mostly because I'm still figuring things out. Yeah. No, of course. But there, I think there's a lot to explore there. Um, yeah, I have some more. Like, I re I, don't, I don't mean to sound like I'm evading the question because I, I, that's not my intention. But I, uh, but at least in the way I work, you know, when I have ideas that are still kind of nebulous, they're like soap bubbles. And if I talk about them, I'm afraid I will it, pop the bubble. It goes no, away. Yeah. 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 No, no. So can you tell us a little bit about like your writing process? Because this is not just a podcast for readers, but it's also for writers. Do you, when you sit down to write a story like um, Wild Acre or where it takes you, do you do an outline? Do you know what's going to happen or do you just write where the wind takes you? How does that, how's your, what's your process like? When I'm writing a short story, I don't outline. Um, okay. I generally have a, a beginning and I have a vague idea, sometimes a vague idea, sometimes a little more solid, but I have an idea of what I'm going, what end point I'm, I'm aiming at. Um, it might not be fixed, but it's uh, but it's a rough, it's like I'm looking across a foggy channel and I can see the lighthouse, you know? And so the, the uh, getting there is where I don't know what happens. And that's the part that is a uh, kind of, created on the fly or like organically is a better way to put it. And, uh, um, writing, writing novels. I have discovered, I've finished one. I'm in, a, I'm in the midst of another. Uh, I, I don't outline per se, but I do have to sort of have a little bit more idea of, uh, some certain points along the way to say, you know, like, I, like I can see the uh, kind of like an archipelago of, of stops, uh, if, even if I can't see the whole story. And having that uh, keeps me more on track. When I was writing the, uh, the novel I just finished, which is called The Strange, I, I didn't do that. And, uh, and I took a wrong turn, and I didn't realize it was a wrong turn until I was 20,000 words past the point to where I made a mistake. Oh. And, uh, and it was it was a it was a demoralizing realization, and uh, it took some time to to cor course correct. But you know, after doing that, I was like, I just thought I can't. I could. I don't want to do that again. You know, I'd rather. So I I, I plan out a little bit more. I wouldn't call it an outline, but it's definitely it's definitely something more than the nebulous zone that I go into when I'm doing short stories. Nathan, how uh, how do you know when you when you've made a wrong turn? Like you said, you went twenty thousand words down a wrong turn path. How how do you know you've made that? And 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 then what do you do to course correct? Um, well, with me, it was that I was I was increasingly uncomfortable and unhappy with the writing, uh, with the story. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever seen the movie uh, 
let the right one in based on the novel. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. There's this, there's this great scene where uh, the vampire walks into the house uninvited. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't remember exactly why, but I think I think it does this to prove to the other to the kid that uh, that it's not good for it. And the longer it's in there, the more it suffers. You know, at mm-hmm. first it's just uncomfortable, and then it just starts to really, you know, it starts to bleed. It starts to become debilitated. That's how. That's I, that's the th- that's what I think of when I think of going past the wrong point. You don't know it at first, and then you go further and further along this road, and it just feels worse and worse and more wrong. And I used to, I would dread sitting down to the computer because I just didn't like the story anymore. I was like, why mm. don't I like this? And then I looked back over the course of what had come before, and I said, oh, I liked it up to this point, and then this is where everything went wrong. And uh, what you do is you just, you just, you know delete it <laughs> you just get it get it out of there just uh go back to the point where things were working and uh and reconfigure you know rethink and start over pretty much you know i'm not i'm not quite that bold i i didn't really delete it i just cut it and pasted it in a different <laughs> document so I can, so right I can mine that I yeah. you, but, uh, you can mine it later yeah exactly yeah but it did mean just taking that twenty thousand words and just ripping it out and you just have to you just have to kind of embrace that moment, right? Like this is the wrong way to go. I've got to get back to what I liked, what, where it was working, and and yep. uh, you know maybe there's something worthwhile in there later, which is always great advice. I love that. I, I love I, I love writing at this time, <laughs> where where we can do that. You just pull out twenty thousand words and put it oh, in a folder, yeah. and you know you're and you know three weeks later you're like hey i had that that little piece in there i'm gonna go pull that back out isn't that sweet that's so sweet <laughs> yeah 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 and it took me probably a week to two weeks to, to come to the point where i could do that and i just mm-hmm. i knew it but i couldn't do it for for a, a week or two it's like i just can't bear myself there's got to be a way i can make this work there's got to be a way i mm-hmm. can't twenty thousand words and it was awful and then i did it and it was liberating. It was just like it's like oxygen flowing back into the room. Freeing, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Almost sounds like an abusive relationship. Like you're just dreading. <laughs> just, it, well, it does. And then you no, you're, you're not have, wrong. You're not wrong. You <laughs> cut loose, and now you're yeah. free, and you yeah. can go on to have either another abusive relationship, or you can learn. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> Nathan, do you uh, do you share your work as you're writing it with anyone? Does any does anyone beta read for you? Uh, not well, not really. Uh, uh, I do have a friend, the writer Dale Bailey. He's an excellent writer, uh, and he and I read each other's stuff pretty frequently, um, but not so frequently and not so uh, rigidly that I would think it qualifies as a beta reader. Mm-hmm. But. Uh, if I'm having trouble with something or if he's having trouble with something, we'll give it to each other. Uh, if something is finished uh, and uh, I'm not sure of it, I'll send it along to him just to get his opinion. But typically, uh, not really, no. So you're just on your own. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I feel, uh, yeah. You're on your own. Didn't James Blaylock beta read one of your books, Rob? The, uh, he didn't. No, he didn't beta. He he uh, he read it for a cover quote, which was oh, okay. which was very nice of him. Uh, like I, we were we were very lucky. Usually he doesn't do he doesn't read books for cover quotes. Uh, but my publisher happened to be friends with him and was like, "Ah, let's just let's just throw it over the fence and see if he comes back with anything." And, uh, but yeah, I'd love for him to beta read my stuff. Well, I, liked, I like, I like James Blaylock. I liked, I think I read the coin. I can't remember what I read. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The homunculus, uh, and, uh, uh, he's big steampunk, huge, yeah. huge steampunk guy. Blaylock is terrific. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah, he's good. Um, so Nathan, now, because you write about all this supernatural, you know, stuff, have you ever had an experience, a supernatural experience that. No, not really. Um, the only thing that I found that felt like it, um, was, uh, when I came back here, uh, from living in new Orleans, uh, this was back in 2005, I was talking to my, uh, my brother who lives here and we were reminiscing about when we were kids and this one house we lived in. 
And uh, and he mentioned something about the second floor of the house. And I looked at him like he was crazy. So the, that was a one-story house. There was no second floor. And he looked at me like I was crazy. Uh, and he was like, of course there was. And so we argued about it for a few minutes. And then he said, well, let's get in the car. And uh, drove by there. And uh, there, in fact, was a second story in that house. And I have no memory of it. Can't recall it today. Uh, we lived in the house for years. And, uh, and uh, you know, if I had seen it with my own eyes, I would insist to this day that there was not a second story to that house. And that felt eerie to me. Um, it, it, it's clear, it's clear to me, Nathan, what's happened is you've crossed over from another dimension without knowing yeah. it. Yeah. It's a parallel yeah. reality, right? Second, those pesky second stories. Yeah. <laughs> That's when you know, because the house is wrong. <laughs> what do you mean I have a bungalow? What, did you, what do you like to do for Halloween, Nathan? Uh, Halloween, I love, uh, I love everything about Halloween. I love yeah. the, the spooky lights. I love the atmosphere. I love the cheesy toys. Hmm. Uh, I love the t-shirts and the cardboard wall hangings. Uh, Halloween, I will fill up a bowl of candy for anybody who comes by and knocks on my door. Um, uh, I live in an apartment building, so sadly that's not many people. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I was going to say, because do the, do the, do your neighbors know that they have like this, you know, sort of. I don't want to say deviant, but <laughs> <laughs> all writers are deviants. Let's just get it out there. <laughs> this purveyor of nightmares in their midst. Are you like the Boo Radley of your neighborhood? I don't few know. people in my immediate life have any idea. Um, <laughs> really, eh? So you just walk around in disguise as like this, you know, this normal looking guy, but in the meantime. <laughs> He's mild mannered, but. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't put a pen in that guy's hand. <laughs> so, and that's I, a, I think, sorry, go ahead. Go nope, go ahead. No, you go. Okay. I was going to say that's that's a really good question, Nathan. What do do you write? I assume you write on a computer, but I know I know uh, some famous writers only write with a particular ballpoint pen on a yellow pad. Do you have any of that kind of stuff? I don't really. Uh, I like gel pens. Gel <laughs> <laughs> pens are fun. But, um, <laughs> But uh, no, I, I write mostly on the computer, but I will go to pen and paper if I start feeling blocked. Mm. I find that just changing the pace of the composition helps unlock things. So, you know, computer tends to be things tend to flow more quickly. And if, if I can't get past a point, I will do pen and paper because it slows me down and forces my thoughts to slow down. And that usually does the trick. How do you deal with writer's block? Um, whine, complain, and feel sorry for myself. <laughs> Basically, like how every other writer deals with this. Right? I, I thought he was going to go a totally different route and say wine, scotch, bourbon, in that order. <laughs> no, that's you, Rob. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, a couple ways. One is the one is the way I just mentioned. Uh, I will uh, just, just just change the way I'm writing, and sometimes that's all I need to do. Um, sometimes I will, sometimes it's because an idea is not fully, uh, there yet. And so I will just kind of like put it in the back burner in my brain and, uh, work on a different thing. I generally have a few different projects going on at the same time. Um, and, and sometimes or often in very different styles. And so changing from one to the other will also help. Uh, and just let the subconscious take over an, an idea that isn't, isn't, you know, isn't flowing. And, uh, and sometimes, honestly, I'll just, uh, you know, my first answer is only half a joke. Cause sometimes I'll just, uh, just sit with it for a while. Um, and, uh, and feel frustrated by it and, uh, and, and wait, you know, uh, it's, I typically don't try to force it because I typically regret it when I do. So um, if I really can't figure out what happens next, I will just wait a while. And just kind of let your subconscious chew on the problem. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and uh, you know, I, and then I guess that's when I'll try to work on something else, but um, it's, it's, uh, I think, I think that, uh, that periods of inactivity 
as long as you're thinking about things, even if you're not consciously thinking about things, are important when you're writing. Yeah. And I think sometimes uh, we have a hard time acknowledging this because when we're not putting words onto a page, we feel like we're somehow uh, not doing the job. Hmm. But I think the job is more nebulous and more mysterious than that, you know, not to sound too, you know, silly. But, um, but I think periods of quiet uh, and inactivity are an essential point, a uh, part of, of, of writing, maybe of any artistic endeavor. Hmm. Describe a typical writing day for you. Um, I don't know if there's a typical one. I will get up. I, I go back and forth between wanting to write in the morning and writing, wanting to write at night. Uh, it's, and, and I don't know what, I'm sure there's a reason. I'm sure there's a, like a mechanism behind that cycle that makes sense. Uh, I haven't learned what that is. Uh, so sometimes I'll get up in the, in the morning, I'll make some coffee, uh, make some eggs, sit down and, uh, and do my writing then. And it's, and it's, uh, it's really piecemeal. I'll try to hit word counts rather than hit hours. I know some writers will say, I'll just write for three hours. And if I do that, then I'm good. And no matter what the word count is. And I, I respect that and kind of envy it. Um, uh, but because I'm constantly getting up, uh, I'm constantly distracted by one thing or another, uh, sometimes justifiably and sometimes because I, I'm just having a hard time, you know, focusing on the story. Uh, so I might, I might have three or four sessions and only squeeze out 500 words, or I might have one session and, and get out, you know, 1500. Um, it's, uh, I guess, it, I guess the story is flowing. This is a facile thing to say, but I guess the story is, you know, flowing. I'll uh, one session will produce a lot. And, but if it's not, then it will just take me all day, you know, of getting up, sitting down, getting up, sitting down and just, hacking at the rock with a pickaxe mm. and uh and and trying to get to 500 um so uh, the typical day is going to depend on whether or not i'm uh you know uh in the zone so to speak yeah i was just going to say in the zone and now i know and then so what do you use it as a distraction say that you're you know you're on your third day of struggling to get something out um, what do you use as a distraction? Uh, I'll get on the motorcycle and just go, go for a ride. Uh, it's, it's, it's the most Zen like experience, uh, that I have personally had, uh, just we could, because when you're, when you're riding the motorcycle, you have to think about everything in the immediate sense. You know, you have to be aware of the road conditions. You have to be aware of the traffic around you. You have to, if there's weather, you have to be aware of that. Um, you have to think about so much at once, um, that you cannot think about other things. You know, your mind just doesn't wander. Uh, you can't get lost in your thoughts and, uh, you can to a certain cosmetic degree, but not really like, like if you're driving a car, or if you're sitting on your couch, staring at the wall or a television. Um, and, uh, and I find that it's like a, blast of wind through my brain and just blows away cobwebs and blows away all the collected dust and sand. Uh, and it's, uh, it's like meditation. And if I do that for a uh, couple of hours, I can come back and I feel like I can think again. Yeah. Like you took the words right out of my mouth. It's I, I call it things like that accountable meditation, because whereas you can't let your mind water, you have to be in that moment yet still you're being freed up somehow. Accountable meditation. I like that. That's, that's what I call it. Yeah, accountable <laughs> meditation. Do you ever think, the, I, and I thought about you too, because I was like, oh, you know, I wonder if he'll write a book about, you know, being on the back of a motorcycle, like a, a reaper that rides a motorcycle around collecting souls or something. You know, I just saw this, you know, doing this and, you know, and it's so there you go. There's a, there's a story idea. Well, it's funny. Um, I, I do want to write about uh, the motorcycle and being on a motorcycle, but I would probably want to do it in a, you know, as an essay or a, a series of essays. What's stopping me is trying to figure out a way to do it in this, in a way that's interesting to people who, who don't ride or have no intention of riding. Mm. Um, and I've written, I've, I've read several motorcycling books and, 
and you know some good some not so good but they're kind of all of a piece and so i'm trying to figure out how to do it in a way that's interesting and well i i think anything that you write is going to be interesting regardless <laughs> um you know i mean you could uh, yeah and, and that i'm, I'm going to look for, i look forward to that because i feel like uh, my dad has a motorcycle and he actually <laughs> rode a pardon i'm sorry i just coughed oh that's okay bless you um my dad actually rode his motorcycle. He rides his motorcycle everywhere. His last trip, he rode it across from Canmore, Alberta, to the tip of Peru or something like that. Oh, okay. Yeah, and so there's a group you can actually join called Freedom Riders, I believe, um, and it has like all these different people who ride motorcycles and and their stories about their journeys. But I feel like riding a motorcycle. It, it, and it's like riding a horse. So I, I call my horse nature's motorcycle all the time, except for it costs me way more. You know, I tried to put it in the garage and just fill its tank with gas. But that didn't work. <laughs> and, um, you know, it just gives you a sense of being sort of closer to the earth and to the wind and to the trees and, and that you don't get, you know, driving in a car. And I always like to say, like, a motorcycle is like sailing on land, you know. Mm -hmm. It's it's the closest thing you can get to sailing on land because you're just so much more in the moment in that environment um, on a motorcycle. So kudos to you for you know because I know that motorcycling uh, the you just got your motorcycle recently, didn't you? You just started riding like I well, started riding. I, I rode a lot in New Orleans. I started riding oh. again. Uh, it's oh. been about a year. Yeah, you started riding again. Okay. Well, that was you know Nathan. I mean. Thank you so much. I mean, I think we've uh, covered the gauntlet of questions, haven't we, Rob? Yeah, absolutely. It's Rob so Wright, great to talk to you, Nathan. I really appreciate you having me on. It yeah, no, thanks for coming on the show. I mean, and, and listeners, for everybody listening, um, I want you to pick up North American Lake Monsters. You can get it anywhere. Any, you can get it online, and you can find it in the bookstores. Nathan, I found it in um, Rhode Island in an HP Lovecraft-based uh, bookstore. Um, yeah. 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 And I took it to the guy behind the counter. I'm like, have you read this? And he's like, no, I haven't. And I'm like, well, you should. But I'm going to take this copy. You can find one somewhere else. <laughs> uh, and and he, I think, so I think he picked it up. And for anybody else listening out there, you definitely want to pick it up, especially right now for Halloween. If you're looking for spooky tales to tell at your socially distant party of six people only, um, as well as Nathan's book, Wounds, which is six stories from the borders of hell, which is terrifying and um check out his series on hulu in the usa in canada it's coming out on october 31st on the crave app you can watch some of it now on the ctv uh drama app but for now um we are going to say goodbye to nathan ballingrude the spine chilling award-winning Sultan of Syntax, Word Nerds, and All Around Purveyor of Nightmares. Nathan, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. This was really a good time. Oh, good. I'm glad you did. And a quick shout out to my sponsor, uh, Wayne Goodman of Goodwin's Greenhouse Supply and Service. Go see Wayne. Get a greenhouse. Grow some vegetables. Thank you, everybody. Until next time, keep reading. <laughs>